Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is La Jessica Stringfellow, and along with my co-moderator, Andrew Hairston, we welcome you to uh, this webinar. This webinar is brought to you by the American Bar Association Young Lawyer Division and um, the Civic Engagement Committee. Uh, when we began to plan for this webinar, uh, COVID-19 was uh, something we hadn't encountered yet. But since then, um, our world has changed quite a bit and the need for volunteers for the 2020 election cycle has only increased as a uh, result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So today we have uh, three panelists that will be presenting to you all. Um, they each have a, a varied background related to election law um, and uh, today you'll hear from Bailey Rose. Uh, she is an attorney at Dittons, Bingham and Greenbaum in Kentucky. She also is the general counsel for um, the Kentucky Democratic Party. Um, you also will hear from Jess Unger. He's an attorney at um, Advancement Project in um, Washington, D.C. And finally, you will hear from Lyle Trawick, who is an attorney at Robinson Gray in um, South Carolina, where he practices in election law. Um, we won't hold you long. We want it to be brief, but very um, informative for you all. And so uh, we will have three polling questions that will be prompted before you uh, as we go through our presentation. And we'll go into our first polling question now, which is, have you previously volunteered in an election before? Um, And volunteering could be for um, in, in any way. No, so the uh, majority said, 75% said no, 25% said yes. Awesome. Um, with that being said, I'll now turn things over to Bailey Rose. Great, thank you so much. Um, and it's great to, to see all of you um, on the chat today. I know um, this is uh, such an important um, election year, obviously, and um, it's great to see so much interest in uh, in volunteering. And as we saw in that last poll question, um, for people who haven't volunteered before. So this is an area um, of, of uh, opportunity, I think, for young lawyers to get involved. And um, I hope we can uh, all, as panelists, bring you um, some ideas for how you can get involved um, in the primary if that hasn't taken place in your state yet, and if not, um, or if it has been in the general election coming up later this year. Um, so as uh, La Jessica mentioned, I am in Kentucky and um, our primary has been uh, moved to June 23rd. So it was initially supposed to take place in mid-May and because of COVID-19, we have um, pushed things off a little bit, which I think is, is really great um, and will provide um, some more opportunities to keep everybody safe as we, as we vote in the primary this year. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the things that we see uh, when volunteering on election day or before election day um, in a normal year and then kind of how COVID-19 is affecting things here in Kentucky and then I'll kind of wrap it up by giving you some ideas um, on how you can get involved if any of the things that I mentioned um, seem of interest to you. So. Um, as La Jessica mentioned, I uh, work with the um, Kentucky Democratic Party um, as a pro bono role, and um, I uh, help a lot with um, uh, voter protection efforts um, on Election Day and really pretty much year round because it really can be a year round um, thing that we need to pay attention to. Um, so even though I have kind of this partisan background, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are, are not related to um, any, any one party or any one um, political ideology. These are really things that, um, you know, as Americans, we, uh, you know, we have the right to vote and um, the goal should always be to allow everybody who is eligible to vote um, to cast that vote if they so choose. Um, so on a normal election day, um, what we do uh, here in Kentucky is um, we have usually a hotline that is up on election day and also usually in kind of the weeks leading up to election day as well. Um, so on a normal, uh, regular time when uh, we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, some of the calls that we would get to that hotline um, could be anything from um, questions about uh, when, when are the polls open? You know, when can I go and vote today? Uh, where is my polling location? I, I've never voted before. Can somebody help me look up where my, uh, where my precinct is and where my, my polling location is? Um, what kind of voter identification do I need to bring to the polls? 
Um, I, I moved in the last 30 days. Am I still able to vote? Am I still registered? Um, you know, I, I sent in an application for an absentee ballot, but I haven't received it. Is there any way that I can still vote today? So um, even though uh, so many of us in our minds, you know, where our polling location is, what day election day is, um, when, you know, we've got a plan to vote, we've made a plan to vote. Um, so many people, so many of our neighbors and in our community um, do, do not have that plan or they do still have questions. Um, or it could just be somebody's first time voting and they've never done it before. Um, so the, um, for us, the hotline is so important because we can answer those questions and we can be a resource to people. Um, and on these, on this hotline, we don't screen calls. We will help any voter who calls. So, um, you know, keep that in mind uh, as, as everything today. Um, but that's on a normal, just a normal primary, a normal general election. Um, these are the kinds of questions that we get and uh, the kinds of things that we try to educate voters about. So in the last few weeks here in Kentucky, uh, we've had a lot of changes as a result of COVID-19. So um, I'll just kind of briefly go through the changes that we've seen here. Um, but at about um, a little over a week ago, um, the uh, it was announced that there was a bipartisan effort to um, have everybody be eligible in this upcoming primary to vote by mail. So everybody is going to be able to use that. Um, it's kind of like a absentee ballot process that's a little bit tweaked. Um, but in order to ensure everybody's safety, we're encouraging as many people as possible to, to use this vote by mail process. So there's going to be a postcard that goes out in mid-May from the Secretary of State, and it's going to have all the information about how to request your absentee ballot. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, you also um, are going to have in-person absentee eligibility um, starting on June 8th. So running from June 8th to June 23rd, which is the day of our primary, uh, you're able to go into um, your County Board of Elections office and vote in-person absentee is what we call it. So we're hoping that this will also um, kind of make it so that voters can go in when there's not going to be as many people around. They're not going to have to stand in line like they would on Election Day. Uh, hopefully they'll be one of just a few people in um, in that office at that time and they can vote just like they went on election day. Um, and everybody's gonna have the opportunity to basically say, because of a medical emergency, um, I'm able to vote absentee, either by mail or um, in-person absentee. There's gonna be opportunities for drive-through voting. Um, and then of course, on election day itself, uh, you will still be able to vote just as you normally would, um, although obviously there will be some additional precautions um, that people will be taking for social distancing and things like that. Um, and because we want to protect not only voters, but of course our poll workers and things like that as well. Um, so of course, with all these changes being announced, voters have a ton of questions. So I'm seeing this not just in my role uh, with the KDP, but also, um, you know, just seeing this among my friends and my family um, who are, you know, a little bit confused about what this means and how they go about getting their absentee ballot. Um, you know, do they need to be able to pay for postage? Um, when do they have to mail the ballot back in? So uh, these are all things that are kind of um, rolling out right now. And um, they're, they're, I'm sure there will be more and more clarity in the coming weeks. Uh, but voters have a lot, a lot of questions. Um, and so we're really hoping um, that people like you who are on this call will, um, will help out and, and volunteer um, and, and help us get the word out to, to voters. Um, so some of the roles that we um, usually look to lawyers to fill, um, both leading up to election day and on election day, um, there are so many of them. There's so many opportunities. Um, so of course, as I mentioned, we run this and um, we're running this through um, a political party, a state political party. Um, but there are other organizations, nonprofits, nonpartisan organizations that also um, do run hotlines and things. So um, it's very likely that in your state, uh, you're going to have some, um, some organizations that help with voter education, um, that help with voter registration. This is another huge opportunity for folks is to help um, people get registered to vote. So whether that's, um, you know, going and speaking at, um, you know, to high school seniors, obviously right now um, you can't quite go in and speak to, to some, but um, there might be ways for you to get involved and in, um, organize a Zoom class uh, with, a, with a high school civics um, teacher that you might be connected with. And, and just speaking to seniors about the importance of registering to vote and, um, and casting their vote and, and keeping their registration updated. That's a great way to get involved. Um, 
if you want to um, volunteer in one of these hotlines, it, it's really just a matter of kind of seeking out that, that organization and, and signing up. Um, a lot of organizations offer training to volunteers, so it won't be that you need to know the law going in cold. Um, it's really, you know, you're going to get a little bit of training, maybe a cheat sheet, um, things that'll help you be able to, um, to kind of make sure that you're uh, giving out the right information, but it's a huge, huge help just to have um, that manpower um, on election day and leading up to election day. Um, a lot of these organizations too might be putting out voter education materials. So um, if you're not somebody who either has the time on election day to spend uh, manning the phone, um, or you're just kind of someone that, that likes to write more than do public speaking, um, it's, it's a huge help to have somebody, uh, especially a lawyer who can read the statutes, read the regulations, uh, put together kind of voter education materials um, that can you know, be blasted out onto social media channels or mailers or whatever um, this organization focuses on. Um, we also always encourage folks to um, become poll workers. Um, and I know some folks later on are going to talk more about this as well, um, but that's a huge opportunity for, for folks to get involved in um, a nonpartisan way and to serve such a vital, vital role um, is to serve as one of these poll workers who spends election day helping people vote, um, answering questions and things like that. Um, I also love to encourage people to get involved um, with their state or county boards of election. Um, this is something you can do um, not only uh, just around election day, but, but more year round. So whether that's actually getting um, a seat on that board um, or it's just kind of paying attention, uh, that's really, really important um, to, to kind of, you can tune into those meetings a lot of times, either in person or um, a lot of them are cast um, remotely even uh, in non-pandemic uh, times. Um, so just kind of making sure you're aware of when those meetings are and, and keeping abreast of what's going on um, with your state and county boards of election uh, is really, really important. And it's always good to have additional folks who are really tapped into what's going on uh, with those boards and um, to help make positive change for, uh, for the voting uh, related issues that you care about. Um, and then of course uh, on election day, you know, I've mentioned some of the hotline calls that we get. Uh, we we tend to have a couple different roles on the hotline. So one is just kind of a pure voter education role, where again, you're just answering those questions that come in. Uh, but we also always need to have volunteers on election day to help voters who, uh, for whatever reason, have not been able to cast their vote. Um, so we see this every year where um, just through some bureaucratic issue or uh, maybe even a little bit uh, more intense issues come up on election day. And as a result, um, that voter needs to <clears throat> appeal their denial of their right to vote on election day. You've, you've got to do it. Uh, right then, right there. Um, in Kentucky, you know, the process is one way. I'm sure it's different in, in some other states. But we've seen everything from um, people who have uh, moved within a certain window where they still should be allowed to vote, but um, for whatever reason, they were they're turned away from the polls. Um, we've seen people um, who, in, for some reason in the voter rolls, it said that they were a, um, a felon. And so in Kentucky, um, for a long time, um, you were not able to vote if you had, um, a, you know, a felony on your record. And um, we got a call last year. This person um, had never been convicted of a felony or arrested or anything, but it was just some sort of bureaucratic glitch where on the voter rolls there was a mistake. And so we were able to have a lawyer go and represent her before the county board of elections and then before a circuit court judge and make sure that she was able to cast her vote um, and kind of clear up that issue. So um, truly, uh, you never know what kind of call you're election day, but those are the kinds of things that we do um, want to have a lawyer available because they're going to end up having to go to court and represent somebody. And of course, for the average voter, that can be really intimidating. Um, so having lawyers on call in different counties uh, is always really huge for us. Um, and I think that about covers um, what I wanted to say, but I hope you'll all learn something on this call that um, kind of lets you uh, slot into a role to volunteer in, um, either in the weeks leading up to election day or on election day itself. And um, if you have any questions specifically for me, always feel free to, to reach out. I'm always happy to chat. So thanks. And La Jessica, I think you might still be muted. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll mute myself. There. Uh, thank you, Bailey. One of the uh, 
things that you mentioned was several ways that young lawyers can volunteer. Uh, could you talk briefly about the time commitment? Um, are those ways that you could, um, it's either all day affair or it could be a couple hours. Um, would it vary depending on what you wanted to do um, volunteer wise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really it's a variety based on what um, what I mentioned. So usually on election day, if we're seeking volunteers for that, we do have folks who are either on call all day if they're a lawyer who's kind of volunteering. Um, if it's someone who's manning the hotline, we might have someone there from 6 a.m. To, to 6 p.m. while the polls are open. Uh, but we also usually have folks sign up in shifts. So if you've just got a couple hours or an hour, you can, you can jump on um, for a little while there. Um, things like working with a state board or a county board of elections, um, that's going to be more of a significant time commitment. Um, and that can be for people who are like ready to um, take on kind of a more intense um, role in monitoring this process and, and keeping uh, involved with that. Um, but I would say most organizations um, that I'm aware of who do, um, who help organize volunteers for election day, the time commitment can be whatever uh, whatever you want it to be. Um, it can be as much as um, dedicating a couple hours to drafting up some voter education materials uh, for an organization. Um, it can be uh, as much as joining the board of that organization and being really involved in, in fundraising or um, helping to, uh, you know, kind of strategize about what um, what that organization is going to do for the upcoming election. Um, so yeah, I think really it's it's up to the volunteer uh, what they want to give. And um, I know from our perspective, we're always willing to work with uh, with anybody and be flexible to, to what they can get. Thanks so much to both of you, Bailey and LaJessica. As LaJessica said at the beginning, my name is Andrew Hairston. I'm hired to be a co-moderator with LaJessica and I'm an attorney at Texas Appleseed in Austin. At this point, we want to offer our second poll question, which is, do you have a plan to vote in the 2020 election? Feel free to take a few moments to answer. Everybody has a plan, that's excellent. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I voted on Super Tuesday two months ago in the Texas primary, and it's hard to believe that things have shifted so drastically. Uh, so with that poll question done, I'll kick it over to Jess Unger. Thank you, Andrew, and hello, everybody. Um, I should I should share that my personal plan to vote in the in the primary in Virginia, where I where I live, is to vote absentee. I've already requested my absentee ballot, and um, I would encourage a lot of you to do the same, <laughs> given present circumstances. Um, I, thank you all again for joining this webinar on volunteer opportunities um, in this crazy, crazy election cycle. Um, Nonpartisan volunteer work to help voters vote is more important this year, in particular, than any other year I can think of in recent memory. Um, I just want to stress that every hour that you can help um, your community with with this work uh, will make a huge, huge difference. Um, if you get nothing else from anything that I say today, um, let my two cents just be that your community really does need your time and your talent uh, on these issues. Lawyers can make a huge difference in making elections run smoothly um, where they live. It's, it's your neighborhood, it's your city, it's your community, um, and they need you. Um, traditionally, um, and kind of like Bailey said, um, voter protection has had sort of partisan and nonpartisan flavors. I think the, the parties typically do have operations, but I'm here to talk about the, the nonpartisan options that are available to you. Um, my organization, Advancement Project, is active um, in voter protection work, and we're part of the Election Protection Coalition, which is um, one of the largest nonpartisan efforts in the country. Um, there's a lot of opportunities um, that can fit your schedule. Um, and uh, I'll get to those, uh, but first I want to say a, a little bit about four things that are different about voting in 2020 than might have been uh, from the last elections that we all participated in. Virginia had elections in 2019. I know some other states did. Maybe the last time some of you voted was 2018 or even 2016. Um, and there's there's some new news um, to share. So I'm going to talk about four things that are different in 2020, and then I'm going to talk about some volunteer opportunities for how, how y'all can plug in. Um, so Briefly, the four things that are that are really different are um, list maintenance, um, what what we colloquially call voter purges, um, 
machines and technology have changed a lot. Um, and then the latter two have to do with coronavirus. Coronavirus has affected in-person voting as well as voting by mail. Um, and I'll talk about each of those in turn. On the on the purges uh, front, there was a major case in 2018 that changed the way that um, states can do their maintenance of voter rolls. Um, under the NVRA, states are required to, the National Voter Registration Act, states are required to <clears throat> um, make efforts to keep their voter rolls accurate. And um, I won't go into the details, but this, that Supreme Court case made, made it easier for states to be much more aggressive in the way they scrub their voter rolls. And that has left a lot of people um, in the years since experiencing some really nasty surprises um, where they've been registered in the same place, they haven't moved, um, but because of the way that list maintenance occurs, they find themselves going to their polling place and all of a sudden they're not registered and they can't vote. Um, a lot of us, we think about uh, we think about voting in, I don't know, the day before the election, election day, the week before, and in a lot of states still to this day, that is after the voter registration deadline. Um, and um, the numbers of people that get have been getting purged in the last six months, nine months, um, number in the hundreds of thousands. Um, so uh, this affects every state. Um, it's not a not necessarily a, a partisan issue at all, but um, but there are a lot of people <laughs> who uh, who get taken off the rolls every year, and and uh, the numbers are higher now because of that change in the law. Um, machines. Um, for a long, long time after 2005, which was the last major um, round of federal funding um, for this kind of um, this kind of um, this kind of piece of election funding, um, the Help America Vote Act uh, was was then. Um, states have been trying to make do with machines and equipment that are getting older and older and older. And finally, um, in the last couple of years, Congress has authorized some major new money um, to. Um, to beef up election infrastructure generally, and a lot of states are using that money to replace their sort of aging fleets of voting machines. Um, the only thing about it is that it's 2020, it's a presidential election year, it's prime time uh, for these machines, and a lot of poll workers and a lot of voters have not had a chance to try those machines out yet. Um, so all of a sudden, um, in a major election year that was going to be a big deal anyway, a lot of folks are gonna be interacting with these machines for the first time, and they have not been, um, they have not been um, given a real trial run um, of, a, of a prior election. Um, of course, states are doing their best to try to train people, but that's a, that's a major concern that would have already been a concern pre-coronavirus. Um, but then we also have coronavirus. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that everyone can understand how the coronavirus has affected in-person voting. Um, it's dangerous um, under present conditions to be in large groups um, and, uh, Every state in the country has some sort of guidance um, banning large congregations of people, and and the CDC has issued recommendations about how to operate polling places in these conditions. But um, every single state has gone through some some sort of um, serious controversy about how to adapt their election um, election mechanisms to to this current reality. And for a lot of folks, that means that in person voting um, just isn't going to work. And depending on the timing. Um, that can be a real problem. Um, Advancement Project has been involved in litigation in Florida um, involving people in certain cases, for example, elderly voters who, um, as stay-at-home orders came down just days before um, their presidential preference primary, um, they became rightfully terrified of going to the polls, which was their plan to vote, uh, but it was already past the absentee ballot request deadline, and they didn't have another option because their county, their county wasn't ready. Um, and they effectively lost their opportunity to vote as a result, um, even though they were, you know, they were simply trying to be prudent and keep themselves healthy and safe. Um, likewise, um, people who themselves are sick already, um, if you come down with this horrible virus um, days before election day and you've missed your opportunity to request an absentee ballot, um, what are the options for you? Um, for some people, again, in Florida, um, the reality was that they just weren't able to find another way to vote um, because their county um, wasn't prepared or because they didn't have family members who could pick up an emergency ballot for them. Um, these are real people who um, got caught in the lurch. Um, but vote by mail, now that we have time leading up to the next round of elections, is not a solution for everybody. I think that I think that if you're able to request an absentee ballot, you should. A lot of states have loosened um, in this circumstance the requirements for voting by mail so that you can you can cite some version of coronavirus as an excuse if your state requires an excuse to request an absentee ballot. Um, 
but it's not a silver bullet. Um, for example, in, again, in our Florida litigation, there were some Florida students who were um, ordered by their universities to leave campus, um, but uh, didn't have time to request an absentee ballot. And their plan had been to vote early at a campus voting site, for example. Um, and suddenly that wasn't an option. Um, definitely, uh, as, you're, as you're forming your own plans to vote, and it sounds like everybody on this call does have one, make sure that you're aware of the absentee ballot deadlines and that you request in time. Um, but absentee, absentee voting or voting by mail isn't a solution for everybody. Um, some communities uh, in our country, my home county, um, a lot of communities of color just aren't, uh, aren't accustomed to voting by mail and they're, they're state by state and locality by locality. There are cultures where we just vote in person. I mean, my home county, I think at 90 plus percent of folks just vote in person and voting by mail is not what we're used to. Um, and there are um, there's opportunities and needs to, for education around the subject, and um, the county may not be ready to scale up by 90% uh, the amount of requests that they're going to get uh, for vote by mail. Likewise, um, there's some communities around the country, for example, Native American communities, uh, where not everyone has a postal address or they're not reached by the by USPS, um, and uh, and there needs to be alternatives uh, uh, that the <clears throat> election officials provide. Um, for, for those communities so that um, vote by mail is not adopted as a one size fits all solution um, in this era. So um, that's a lot about some of the issues that are bubbling up in, in 2020 um, uh, in this election cycle. I want to switch now over to talking about how you can help. And, and um, as we we're talking about earlier, there there's a lot of different ways that you can slot in depending on when you can commit and how much time you can commit to volunteering on these issues. Um, I want to talk about things you can do on election day things you can do before election day, and things you can do really at any time. Um, and there are both formal and informal ways that you can you can help your community in each of those three sort of situations. First on election day, um, above everything, um, be a poll worker. If you can, if you can give up your, your whole election day, be a poll worker. It is the single most important thing right now. Um, there's been reporting that, for example, in the state of Georgia, um, the average age of a poll worker is 70 years old. We know that um, in this uh, COVID-19 epidemic that older folks are especially vulnerable to the ravages of this, this terrible disease. And rightfully so, a lot of older poll workers are, um, are not stepping forward. Um, this is a ABA YLD uh, <laughs> panel, and I would encourage uh, all of you YLD members to consider um, taking taking this year as the year that you step up um, and and be a poll worker. It's a one day commitment. Usually, there's uh, a half day of training ahead of time, or uh, it depends on your locality. But the training is not onerous, um, but it makes a huge difference. Um, so if you have the stamina and you're able to commit to one day um, out of the office, I know we're all lawyers. Um, make make that day election day and be a poll worker. Um, other things you can do on election day are plug into your local or national groups um, that do that do poll watching um, and and other forms of voter assistance. And I'll talk more about that um, with stuff that you can do uh, um, at any time with uh, with regard to hotlines and stuff like that. But a lot of those groups also run field operations where they try to help distribute information to voters who are um, caught or confused or encountering trouble on election day. Um, some things you can do leading up to election day is, is different forms of local accountability work. Of course, first, you need to learn the rules yourself. Um, we, uh, as lawyers, we need to um, be aware of the uh, legal op uh, environments that we're operating in. So um, become familiar with the voting, uh, voting law and rules in your state. There are organizations such as Election Protection that make easy legal guides for you to digest, sort of just providing the information about what the rules are in your state. I encourage you to use those tools. Um, and, and build up an understanding of, of what the rules are in your state. Um, once you know what the rules are, connect with a local group. Um, every state has great local organizing groups that are non-profit, non -profit, non-partisan, um, that do this work. Um, and you know your community better than I do. I'm, um, if you want some help sort of figuring out where to start as you research groups in your area, I'm happy to help um, <clears throat> be that connector, but find your local groups. Um, it, this work should not be um, top down out of a group in DC or top down from some national organization. It really should be a local activity. And I, um, I think you will be surprised at how many great local groups exist uh, to help support this work. I say this to somebody based, based out of an office in DC working for a national group. Um, um, one thing that 
Advancement Project is doing is trying to support those local efforts through something called the Democratizing Voter Protection Initiative. I can talk more um, about that offline. I know we're short on time, but the idea is that we want to be able to support local groups um, and help folks get involved with local accountability work, uh, whether it's attending board of elections meetings, taking notes and just sharing them with your community, or advocating where you see it, where you see a gap, like, hey, that polling place isn't going to work. It's not accessible. Question, questions like that are things that you can do. Um, and we're hoping to help support the local groups that do that accountability work. Um, finally, informally, leading up to election day, um, as we stress on this call, make sure that you personally have a plan to vote and that it actually works in this crazy COVID-19 era. Like once you've made sure that that's gonna work for you and you have your plan, make sure that your family and your friends and your social circle do. Um, I think as attorneys, sometimes we underrate how much we can be looked to as resources and leaders in our social circles and in our communities. Um, or maybe that's just my family. Um, and uh, you should take this opportunity to, 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 to be a leader in that way. Um, ask your social circles, your friends, uh, the people you go to church with, um, the people that you work with, do they have a plan to vote? Um, make sure that it actually makes sense um, given the changes to the election mechanisms that are happening um, in this COVID-19 era, era. Again, that goes back to knowing the rules. Uh, finally, and, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up soon. Um, Things you can do at any time, whether it's on election day, before election day, um, even in some cases after election day, because there's always follow up work to do. Um, consider volunteering digitally. Um, election protection um, has shifted their hotline operation to a virtual space um, in the COVID-19 era. There are no, no longer um, um, rooms with about 50 phones about six inches from each other <laughs> where people are taking calls from voters with questions about where's my polling place uh, or am I registered. Uh, or what ID do I need? Um, it's virtual now, and so it's safe for anybody with a phone and an internet connection to help volunteer and take calls from voters. You can do it. Uh, you can do it cleaning up voicemails that get left in off hours. You can do it live on election day. Um, help voters. Help voters who call that nonpartisan line eight six six R vote, the election protection hotline number. Um, <clears throat> get the answers that they need to be able to vote. Um, consider supporting. Um, anti-disinformation efforts. People are still working on those. And again, reach out to me for more information. Um, but think about the way you personally consume information. Um, um, the internet is getting weirder and weirder. Um, and that's certainly true for election information. Um, weird rumors get spread. And I think that it's important for all of us, again, as lawyers and leaders in our community, um, to be conscious of the way that we consume information, making sure that we're reading a primary source, what the authority is for the information we're reading, making sure that it's accurate, um, and taking steps to correct it um, in, our, in our communities where we are the trusted source of information um, if, something, if, a, if a false rumor is spreading. Um, Again, I can connect you with some of the some of the resources that are getting developed um, to try to counter that disinformation concern at scale um, uh, offline. If you want to reach out, um, finally, as as La Jessica and Bailey talked about briefly, um, if you want to do pro bono work, Lord knows nonprofits are always ready to connect you with pro bono work. There is research and writing, um, there is advocacy work, there is litigation. Uh, we are hungry for volunteers to help us support our own. Uh, our own work in these areas, um, and especially if you're based in some of the states where we're active, um, we're mostly active in the South, Georgia, Virginia, Florida, Louisiana. Um, if you're in any of those states and want to do some more serious pro bono engagement, um, reach out to us at AP and, and we can get you connected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. I'll kick it back to La Jessica. Thanks, Jeff. And um, now we'll have our third polling question. How has your plan to vote in the 2020 election been disrupted by COVID-19? Or has your plan, excuse me. Okay, so 67% of you said it has been disrupted and 33% said it has not. I know personally my plan to vote, um, I'm an in-person voter, but due to COVID-19, um, I definitely will be getting an absentee ballot, um, hopefully to um, keep myself safe as well as my, um, my family safe. Uh, with that said, I will um, turn this over to Lau Trawick for his presentation. Thank you, Jessica, and that's a that's a perfect segue. That's really interesting that two thirds of you said that 
that COVID-19 has certainly had an impact and that of course is where I plan to start uh, my presentation. Um, I can't reiterate enough what the other panelists have said in terms of getting to know the rules. Um, it's, it is vital uh, for you to know that to have uh, an impact in helping ensure a proper election. Um, the rules of the road are very different state by state. As Bailey mentioned earlier, Kentucky uh, has moved to a full mail-in absentee ballot voting uh, option. That is not the case in South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina still has state law in place uh, that has certain uh, requ certain restriction, not restrictions, but requirements that you have to meet uh, to vote absentee. Um, if you're 65 or older, you automatically qualify to vote absentee. If you are sick or caring for someone who's sick, you qualify to vote absentee. Uh, if you have to work or if you're going to be out of town, and there's a whole laundry list of about 15 exceptions uh, that allow folks to vote uh, via an absentee ballot. Um, currently. I can't get into it too much, but there's a ton of litigation in South Carolina right now about various uh, uh, requirements, um, both in state and federal court, uh, that you know could have a big impact on the rules, uh, the state law in place, uh, and our upcoming June primary, which takes place on June 9th. So I know South Carolinians are very anxious. As Lajeska mentioned, she would like to vote absentee, uh, and you know has to figure out. Uh, the exception under which she'd qualify to do so, and, and we don't know if they'll be in place right now. Uh, as it stands, though, the, the law enacted by the General Assembly does have those uh, those requirements in place, and so we'll have to see what happens on that end. Um, that said, the State Election Commission uh, has a number of options in place to ensure the safety of those who do still wish to vote in person, uh, as well as the poll managers. And again, I reiterate what Bailey and Jess said, the best thing you could do to assist in a nonpartisan way in the upcoming election is go be a poll manager. As they mentioned, uh, senior citizens primarily uh, take on this role and understandably do not feel comfortable, nor should they, uh, going to be around a bunch of people on election day. Uh, that said, uh, lots of counties have really stepped up to, to reach out and, and fill these roles. And uh, so I would encourage you to step up and find a way to, to assist in this area. Um, Obviously, sanitation, uh, sanitization will be super important at the polls. I think in South Carolina, they'll be passing out a Q-tip or some sort of cotton swab for you to use uh, on the actual machine. Uh, they'll be sanitizing everything constantly throughout the day. All poll workers will be wearing gloves and masks, and all voters are encouraged to do the same. Um, social distancing guidelines, of course, will be followed consistent with the CDC uh, guidance. And I think it's important that you know all of that. And then also know the various options for curbside voting, which is available to senior citizens in South Carolina, some of the older voters, and uh, early voting uh, is also another option. So just knowing the lay of the land in your respective area is, is vital. And the way you can best get involved uh, is to share that information. Uh, look at it, see what your law says, and uh, again, spread it to your friend groups, as Jess said. Um, or, you know, there's other ways you can you can spread it as well. Uh, lots of law firms have legal blogs. Um, there are various legal publications in which you can publish. Um, in South Carolina, we have what's called the South Carolina Lawyer the Bar Magazine. Uh, we also have various young lawyer uh, division publications, uh, whether it be a blog or a printed newsletter. Uh, you can also take out an op-ed in the newspaper. Uh, there, there's lots of ways you can uh, spread correct information about the current lay of the land for voting in the era of COVID-19. And I think that's gonna be especially critical in the upcoming primaries that various states are having. Uh, and then we'll see where we are. Uh, as everyone knows, it's an ever evolving situation uh, come November when um, a lot of important races up and down the ballot uh, for 2020. Um, so I wanted to move on a little bit. As, as they mentioned, you can also be, be a poll watcher. Of course, there are certain restrictions on that uh, state by state in terms of how close you can be uh, to the actual voting machines and things like that. Um, but th those are all just great things to do. Um, I've, another way to get involved, I've, I've represented folks uh, in nonpartisan ways and of both parties um, up and down the ballot. I've had city council candidates, uh, sheriff's coroners, uh, state house, um, legislative caucuses, all the way up to state political parties. 
Um, and although those are partisan ways to get involved, sometimes those elections don't, or election protests don't center on partisan issues. Uh, in South Carolina, for example, uh, to qualify to serve as sheriff or coroner, you have to meet certain statutory qualifications for law enforcement experience or uh, medicological experience for coroners. Uh, so being aware of those is very important because those are uh, important roles in our state and they have, you know, a lot of influence on on daily activity. And so knowing those is important. And we've had tons of injunctive relief hearings uh, to ensure that only those who are qualified appear on the ballot in those positions. Um, so that's one way to get involved uh, with respect to city council candidates and other local elections that tend to be nonpartisan school districts, maybe. Uh, you know, it, those can be just vote challenges. Um, and I think those definitely have the potential to ramp up this year, uh, particularly when in South Carolina, we're sitting here on May 6th and don't know what the outcome of the current litigation is going to be. What will our absentee requirements be? And so if people don't understand uh, what's required to be able to vote absentee, there's going to be questions on the back end, of course, about what, you know, whether a legitimate ballot was cast. So knowing that is very important. So educating uh, about absentee voting in the era of COVID-19 as all the panelists have stressed uh, is the best way for you to get involved. Um, another thing I wanted to briefly touch on, I recently wrote an article for a South Carolina lawyer about uh, redistricting in light of the US Supreme Court's recent decision. Um, and that segues into the census. Uh, fill it out, it's so easy. They mailed it to your home, you go online, it takes less than five minutes. Uh, that's very important for the U.S. Census Bureau to obtain accurate population data that directly affects the number of congressional districts that you have. And then it also affects um, the num your state house districts, your state senate districts, and even all the way down sometimes to city council districts. Having accurate figures in that is, is vital uh, to ensuring that, that the lines are drawn appropriately and that an appropriate number of people are represented by their representatives uh, all the way up to uh, the US Congress. So I would urge all of you to do that. And there are lots of nonprofit organizations that are pushing, uh, filling out the census and even government organizations that are. Uh, I know in our state, there's been a big push at, at the state level uh, to encourage that as well. Because again, that, that just has all kinds of important effects on our daily lives. And so redistricting, of course, is going to take a different uh, function now. Um, the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has kicked out any uh, partisan gerrymandering claims, but uh, state courts have not necessarily. So that legal landscape could certainly change here uh, in the next couple of years. And it'll be interesting to see when it does after the census data comes down or is collected and released in 2021. And the map makers, which in the vast majority of states are in state legislatures, uh, go back to the drawing board and draw their legislative maps. I think you'll see a lot of, uh, of litigation spawn out of that, uh, as has been the case with um, absentee requirements uh, in the era of COVID-19. So those are lots of different uh, areas of the law, of election law. It's a great area to practice in. If you want to get involved and kind of raise your profile in this area, again, you know, writing is a great way to do that. Uh, let people know that you know uh, the rules and regulations involved, uh, and that you're knowledgeable in that area. And then, of course, once you get it, you know, volunteer for pro bono opportunities, whether those be for nonprofits like uh, that of Jess, or, you know, more local ones, or even uh, political parties. I know the I don't want to exceed the scope here uh, of the presentation as it's for uh, nonpartisan volunteers, but, you know, get, get involved in the process. I think all of us agree on that, irrespective of the side of the political fence on which you fall. Uh, we want everybody to get involved in elections to ensure that they fairly and accurately represent the vote of the populace. And I think with uh, all the stuff we've had here, there's certainly ways to do that and to protect everybody's right to vote. I, I love that Jess mentioned the, the purge list coming up. That's really important to pay attention to. Um, also, the 30-day the, uh, window in South Carolina is the date by which you've got to be registered uh, to be able to vote in that next election, particularly if you've moved, that's very important. And state newspaper, uh, our local paper in Columbia, South Carolina, just recently published something about that. Uh, if your local uh, journalists have not done that, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to, again, do an op-ed uh, as a lawyer 
uh, not giving legal advice, of course, but uh, to do an op-ed and, and just uh, sound the alarm that, hey, that's coming up to let people know. Um, so anyway, those are kind of the main topics that I wanted to touch on. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved. I think you can also use your YLD, um, which typically serve as the, the service arm of the state bars, at least that's the case in South Carolina, uh, to maybe even get a task force to find uh, ways for us as lawyers uh, to do our part in the community, as is our obligation uh, to ensure that we have full and fair elections. Awesome, thank you, Lau. Um, Andrew, did we have any questions? Um, For sure, yeah, we stated? have two really good questions that were posed by our participants. Uh, the first question is, do hotline volunteer opportunities require being physically present in an office, or is that something that can be done from home? I might kick that to Jess, and other folks can plug into it if they'd like. You do not have to be in an office. You can you can do it from home. Um, that's, that's the headline. Um, even in years where there wasn't a pandemic raging through the country, um, you could do, um, I know at least from the election protection, um, Nonpartisan hotline 866 our vote you can you could help them process voicemails that came in during their off hours um, remotely and now because of COVID-19 they've transitioned even their live operations to virtual um, so every single part of their hotline operation you can participate in remotely um, and um, and I'm sure that's probably true for for other hotlines that are out there as well I'm, I'm sure my co-panelists could could speak to that yeah, I think we, um, in years past, the way we've done them has often been, uh, you know, all of us are in one room, but this year we're obviously looking at that um, pretty intently. And I believe that our technology uh, would allow you to be in disparate places. So um, we use a, kind of a, a program that, um, you know, calls come in and it'll hit your cell phone. You kind of like log in on your cell phone and then calls are going to come in um, to one person first. If that person's on the phone, then the call kind of leapfrogs to the next person who's logged into the hotline. And so we all don't need to be um, in one space for uh, for that to work. Um, and so we'll definitely be exploring um, ways to make sure everybody is safe this time around, uh, for sure. Great. And our second question, which is a hot topic uh, based on this conversation we've had today and just national headlines. In Texas, a state court ruled that we can use COVID-19 as a reason to vote by mail, but the Texas Attorney General warned that he would prosecute public officials if they allow this. What do we tell voters? And I might start with Lyle for this one, but anyone feel free to plug in. Sure. Uh, I hate to give a lawyer answer, but that's a complicated question. Um, <laughs> you know, I also don't really want to give legal advice, but I mean, I think I think that you've got to follow the law that's in place, and unless and until uh, it is overturned by a court or you successfully litigate it, uh, or or you know, the General Assembly of your respective state changes it, um, you know, that there. But that doesn't mean there aren't means of recourse to hopefully uh, addressing that challenge. But uh, I mean, in, in my opinion, you know, you got to follow the law as written. And I, I think that's a great example of a way to get involved um, right now as well. Uh, and in a way that it is nonpartisan um, is you can always use your voice to try to influence um, your elected officials. So if this is something that you care about a lot um, or, you know, you have family members or friends who are um, going to have a tough time voting in person, um, and, and really, you know, so many of us are, um, those are the kinds of things that, you know, pick up the phone and, and call uh, all of your elected officials and, and voice your concerns um, and let people know, um, you know, what's going on. And so, you know, as lawyers, when we are advising people, we have to be really cognizant of what the law is. But um, when we're, uh, you know, members of the community that, you know, we can we can state our opinions and, and make sure that our, our voice is heard because it is, um, it's often very respected given um, our stature. So uh, that's another great way to volunteer is to do that yourself and then also organize, you know, friends and family to make those calls as well. Echoing what Lyle and Bailey said, it's it's uh, it's definitely a complicated situation in Texas right now and I don't want to uh, provide conclusive analysis. Um, but it's 
it's a it's a subject of uh, it's been a subject of litigation, and I uh, I'm sure that there are there are groups that you can connect with um, in Texas, partisan but especially nonpartisan that are um, that are answering that question right now for themselves about what they're what they're going to tell voters. And and again, I just encourage you to um, know who's in your community and connect with them um, to um, to do that work. And and again, I'm happy to try to help connect folks um, as best I can as well. Thank you all. I'd like to offer a few expressions of gratitude. First, to our phenomenal panelists today. Thank you, Bailey, Lyle, and Jess. Uh, to LaJessica uh, for really efficient moderating and thoughtful questions and prompts, as always. Thank you. To the ABA at large, to the ABA Young Lawyers Division, and to the Seat at the Table Initiative of the Young Lawyers Division, we offer our gratitude. And as always, to the tireless staff of the ABA, Tracy Kemp, and all the ABA staff members who make these webinars and initiatives run so smoothly. And we'd like to thank all of you for tuning in to this webinar. Uh, we encourage you to share it broadly with your networks once the recording is available. And as all of our panelists said, encourage your friends and family members to get involved in the best way they can to make sure that our voices can be heard in the November 2020 election and beyond. Any other follow-up thoughts, like Jessica? Um, no, uh, just thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists for all of your great advice and insight on the 2020 election cycle. Um, to all of our participants, I really hope that you will use some of this information to take back to your communities, to your local young lawyer divisions, um, and hopefully that you can implement some kind of um, initiative to uh, make sure your community is aware of the changes to the law, how they can go out to vote, and make sure that they are most importantly informed about voting and um, that it is a crucial and um, very big responsibility of our society and that we continue to make sure that it's utilized by everyone. So thank you so much for, volu for volunteering. I'm gonna hopefully that you'll do it and also for participating and tuning in. We appreciate it.